guys, Jeff Chalmers here from discoverdoublebass.com, which is the home of online learning for double bass players. We have a platform to help you, whether you're studying jazz, classical, bluegrass, whatever, it's all over at our website. So please take time to check that out. And if you're new here, welcome. This interview series features some of the world's greatest bass players. And I'm really excited to be joined by somebody whose music I am a huge fan of and I've been following for well over a decade. They're also uh, I'd say one of the stars of an incredible band. The, the reach is mind-blowing. So it gives me, um, yeah, it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome to Discoverable Base. It's Adam Kubota. So welcome, Adam. Thanks, Thank man. you so much for joining me today, Good York. To be here. You know, it's incredible what you guys have done with Postmodern Jukebox. And we were just chatting about the the fact that your videos have been seen. I looked at it yesterday. It's over two billion times on YouTube. So it is truly incredible, the, the reach. And at the front of what you do, the success, is the fact that the quality is outrageously good. Every musician that's in the ensemble, the arrangements, what you do, and you're there, bass player. So thank you for, yeah. for everything, you know? It's just been fantastic to follow your journey. Thank you. I mean, when you say it like that, it's, it's pretty humbling <laughs> to, to know that like two billion people have seen me play the bass and, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy. But do you remember uh, the early days when you was maybe when you there was that bit of traction and did you when did you realize that this was more than just a project or a gig? This is a this is a movement. This is something something more. Would you remember that that moment? Yeah, I mean we had had a couple of like minor viral hits like previous to that. There's actually a really weird project called the Motown Tribute to Nickelback. Yeah. That we had had a little bit of traction with early. Uh, Scott Bradley, who's the the founder, the creator of Postmodern jukebox he was he was looking for something to go viral because it was the age of of you know viral videos um, and and finding out that YouTube wasn't a place uh, just for your cat videos uh, that you could actually make a career from that um, so he was trying to, to figure that out and I think it was maybe between the time that we did this video um, uh, called thrift shop it's a Macklemore song with like that's like the basically the original version of PMJ. Somewhere between there and then they did the um, "We Can't Stop," the, the Miley Cyrus song, um, and those blew up immediately to to the tune of of several million views. And so, and but you know, I got to give credit to Scott Bradley. He he was so confident that this was gonna work, and because he was seeing really? the things that yeah he. He called his shot definitely on on thrift shop, and we were just recording uh, in his apartment in in Queens, New York, and and he just he just had a, a gut feeling, and and I think a lot of it has to do with like the the timing of of where YouTube was uh, in that moment of trying to just just get a lot of uh, YouTube uh, only or, or kind of YouTube centric stars. Um, and they really put us on a platform um, um, with with other other great artists who were doing stuff at the time, and other artists that were you know like non non YouTube stars, like just you know just people who are just famous. It's really an incredible thing, and we're going to dig deep into your journey. I'm going. I've got some questions I want to ask about your bass sure. playing over the time, but let's maybe take a step back and speak about your first uh, the first time that you were really connecting with music who really inspired you at the start of your journey who kind of lit, lit the fire for you with the bass sure um, oh that's that's a tough one um, I think a lot of my interest in music I think just you know being exposed to it as a kid you know just listening to parents LPs I think that's pretty normal listen a lot of a lot of Beatles and wow. Beach Boys and things like that and then you know MTV was so and they actually showed music videos back when I was a kid um, so I remember watching like you know the Red Hot Chili Peppers and seeing seeing Flea perform and you know he was just doing doing this crazy slapping slapping on the bass you know or seeing like Les Claypool I, and I mean that was like such a period for 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 bass you yeah. know for for electric bass uh, especially so I think seeing those guys and how kind of just like weird and expressive you know that they were and it's very it's like you know it's like such high level talent but also a little bit of performance art too um, and then eventually uh, I made the switch where I started on cello and then I went to uh, electric bass uh, and then I was playing youth orchestra and then the conductor needed they always need bass players so they said well you play the bass I think you have a bass personality so that conductor was right because I because I really loved it because um, it's just so many there's so much versatility so I think you know uh, playing classical music I think was it was a big uh, influence on me when I was a kid yeah um, 
And then um, when I was late in high school, uh, I met um, a, a great um, a pedagogue and performer, uh, Barry Green, uh, famous Barry Green, wrote the, the Inner Game of Music and it's just, He's such a fantastic, um, he's a, such a figure in the field of, of classical music and, and just bass pedagogy in general, just really like learning how to generate that community feeling of, of, of playing the bass. And, and he just always, you know, sort of believed in you and he, his teaching didn't really have any, any boundaries in terms of like, okay, well, if you're gonna do you know, work with me, then you're gonna have to start doing only orchestra solos or only orchestra excerpts. You know, he was always in, uh, bringing us uh, to, the, you know, to the community and, and through, through Barry. And uh, he, I met uh, uh, Ray Brown, I met uh, John Clayton, and, and all these people you know, that were coming in, these, these major figures of, of jazz bass playing. So I think I always had it in my, in my mind that always you know, enjoy classical music, but start playing uh, jazz, because that was more fun for me. And it's so great, because Barry's love and enthusiasm for the bass, it just enveloped all music. And uh, you know, I'm sure he must be so thrilled to see what you've achieved with PMJ. I mean, I think I saw him recently on social media at one of your gigs, and he was yeah. catching up with you. Was it really fun to kind of, you know, it's, it's take that step back and reconnect with him after this time. And uh, he seemed like he just had a blast. Oh yeah, <laughs> he's, he's enjoying his life right now. And it, it, it's a cool feeling to, to still be in touch with the person that really, I mean, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now if I hadn't met Barry. Wow. Like, like you know, put a, put a period on that one. Um, Cause he's so, he's so inclusive and, and, and just building community. And it, it was just nice to be in touch with him. And he's just a really sweet guy. His, his wife, there's, they're so nice. They had us over for dinner and we had a jam session and it was just like, and that's how, that's how it should be. And yeah. that's how bass players are. And Barry's also really excited about technology and about growing community and about platforms like YouTube as well. So yeah, it must be really cool. And, and it, talk about switching for into the jazz realm then. Did you take lessons with John Clayton? Or you, you just mentioned Ray Brown, hang on. Like, oh yeah. Tell us, like, hold up. Yeah, I, I don't mean to overstate my, my relationship. Uh, you know, I just literally met Ray like a couple of times and, wow. and didn't really have what did it, What would it feel like to meet him? I mean, it's just, it's kind of like one of those moments where you, you know, you, sh you shake the guy's hand and you, and then you're like, and you think you're like, this is what it felt like to, to shake, you know, Ray Brown's hand or, or something, you know, it's just like one of those, you just see him, you know, play a great set with a, you know, trio. I think he was playing with, uh, with, you know, Benny Green or Jeff Keezer, you know, the times I saw him play and, you know, just, just, just amazing. You know, he's, yeah. he's just the swing, the thump, all those things. So it was great. Did you get to take any lessons with the great John Clayton or other jazz kind of artists at that time? Um, no, I, 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 you know, so, so Barry, because of the community building that he uh, is just always engaged in, um, he would throw, a, he had this thing called the Bass Bash. Yeah. And, the, and, the, and the, he started something called the Golden Gate Bass Camp. Which is still going, I believe. Which is well. still going yeah, so. with a different, yeah, different, different group of people. He would always be bringing these people in. So, you, you know, you get some firsthand uh, contact with, the, you know, with folks. And, and Rufus, Rufus Reed was always coming in. And, yeah, you know, it's just in a way that you, you get to interact with, like, you know, John. I've, you know, had dinner with John, you know, a few times. And he's such a funny guy, such a nice guy. You know, um, and uh, and Rufus, you know, I got to be Rufus Reed's, uh, uh, you know, as a 22 year old kid, you know, I was just driving Rufus Reed around, oh, you know, wow. to base camps and stuff and just chatting with him about, you know, his life and everything. So just to get the perspectives and just and just I think, you know, to, just to hear what they have to say about how you should be approaching the base and, um, and it just you get a lot from that you just absorb so much and you kind of just apply those rules in your in your practice like you know over over the years something you get from these people the presence of these people isn't there and it could be just in passing you know meeting ray brown you don't forget that you know even if you just shake the man's hand and say how much you love his music and i once met john clayton when i was much younger in 2002 yeah. uh, i can remember the gig and uh, and i shook his hand and said how much i loved his music we spoke a little bit about ray brown but i remember that so vividly we were talking oh, yeah. i remember the album i remember the song that we were talking about that did this arrangement of little darling it was gorgeous at the blue note Okay, so moving on, you then studied with somebody that I wasn't expecting you to study with, who is mm -hmm. Robert Black, the late great artist. And I was, yeah, really interested to hear about the more avant-garde side of, tell us a, a bit about studying with, with Robert. What, was, what did that look like? 
Yeah, um, it was, I mean, Robert, he was a, a truly inspirational figure for me um, because he's somebody who just was such an amazing player, but he just had this sort of like other thing. He was this like new music yeah. rock star guy and he was making this this cerebral, cerebral, very, very strange, uh, very expressive uh, type of music uh, c come alive in a way that was like very, very exciting and bringing these, these, these artistic ideals, these concepts, and just into his daily life as a performer. And to me, that was so incredibly compelling. And I was lucky enough to to get a scholarship to go study with him and get my masters. And I did just a ton of. Of contemporary music, um, uh, it just I, I don't get to do you know nearly enough any of that anymore. But it's it's just more about the 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 presence, the presentation, the fearlessness that that, that he he represents, and uh, and that's it was a, it was a very cool experience for me from from that side of things. Yeah, I, I didn't have the pleasure, unfortunately, of ever seeing him perform, but it's, uh, yeah, uh, that sounds oh, like yeah. a really incredible. The bang on a can, all stars. I mean, yeah. that, that is such a cool group. Yeah. And I just got to see them so many times. And it's just always like, you just, you're just not exactly sure what's gonna happen sometimes. And it's, it's, and they're just not afraid to just do weird stuff on stage. And I think that, I think for me, musically, that's my, that's my, performance ideal. I don't even know if it's my music ideal. It's like my artistic ideal. And then how's, you know, how's the tour life treating you now? You are doing a significant number of dates, a significant amount of time on the road. How are yeah. you finding that experience? Yeah, I, it's hard to, to sort of separate um, that question from like, that's just like, it's for me, that's like, how does it feel to be alive? Yeah. Uh, because that's that's like my, my existence these days. Um, it is It is fantastic. You know, it's one of those things I never, I never expected that that to happen to me. Um, I never expected to to be a full time internationally touring musician. And as we were discussing before, I was I was in law school uh, when when Postmodern Jukebox got got big. Um, so I I never take it for granted. And it's really fun just to have to go like we've we've toured. We're coming up on our one thousandth show of all time. And we've performed on 54 different countries, six different continents, and just the amount of, you know, the amount of gigs that I've done, the amount of people I've shared the stage with, you know, the, the amount of, you know, audience members that have been out there. I mean, it's just, I, I, one day I'll just, you know, probably, you know, s sit on a mountaintop and, and, and it'll all sink in, like what's happened to me. Um, so that stuff is just, is, is unbelievable. You, you can't beat that experience. But also it's, you know, being on the road, it's not easy, you know, for, for everybody. Um, so I'm, Do you have a routine, like a daily routine, or is it just kind of what, whatever the world has for you that day, or you get up at, you know, yeah. 6 a.m. and run every day, or oh, are God, you? no. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say that, um, a, like, a little bit of exercise every day goes a long way. Uh, you know, I, I try to take care of myself. I, I do go running a lot, as you probably noticed on my social media. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've arrived, I've done a couple of marathons in my life. So it's about just, it's about, you have to just take care of your body and, and, and take care of your, your mind, your emotions and all that stuff. So running really helps me and I do some, you know, I do something called hit workouts. That's oh like, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. some YouTube workout videos. So, cool. so that's all. That's all good. But it's for me. It's it's that. It's a, you know just a little bit of practice. Unfortunately, you can't get a lot of real uh, substantive practice in on the road. Yeah, that was, I had that question. What does that look? I mean, do, are you? A, yeah, how does that look? You know, your practice is it something that you're able to spend time doing? Do you have stuff that you're specifically working on, or is it just I've got an hour with the bass, I'll just enjoy myself? You know. Yeah, um, you know, it's it's more about it's more about maintenance. I think it's more about keeping certain like modalities in your in your mind open um, when you're when you're trying to um, you know stay on the road. Um, so for me, it's a lot of like really uh, um, I don't know. I hate to say boring, but I I definitely have like on the electric bass. I have like an arpeggio scale routine that I do just about every single day. Do it with my eyes closed. You know, I try to stay, do it with the metronome. It's just about 
you know, just making sure that you're thinking in a way that is connecting chords uh, and you're playing in time and you're making the metronome swing. Um, so there's that. Um, there's, there's a, you know, I have a White Whale project, which is, uh, it's, that's like, it's me playing Donnelly in all 12 keys on the electric bass. Um, not, not, I'm not there yet. I'm, I'm about halfway there. Uh, you know, and uh, oh, it's always rep building on electric bass for me, like learning all the, all the, all the songs. And then uh, upright bass, it's a little bit more, it's more about the feel, it's more about, like I do, believe it or not, I actually find like the, the Abersol tracks, uh, you know, certain ones to be super helpful um, when you're on the road, it just gives you like, just to, for me playing quarter notes is like a big thing, like I, I just really enjoy it, you know, so much. I think it's the most important part of, of you know, being a, being a jazz bass player, you know, having, having good time, having good intonation and, and being able to play in all 12 keys. So, so I do a daily, uh, all the things you are in 12 keys uh, practice. So that's the one, that's the one that I do. And um, yeah, just, just stuff like that. And also just like basic sort of, you know, maintenance of, of, of you know, building repertoire, but it's, it's hard to do, to do real practice on the road unless you're really focused on it. And when I'm in Europe, um, it's, it's, you want to get out and you want to see the world. So, um, you know, as a, gosh, I'm, I, I don't know to, to whom to attribute this, this quote, but it's, you know, for art, it's, if there's, if there's no input, there's no output. So as much as I'd like to stay in a practice room all day and just, you know, just keep, keep shedding. I, and I, when I'm home, I do that. Um, but when I'm on the road, I like to go out and see things and I just, it just gives me a lot of inspiration. Do you spend a lot of time learning uh, new music for the tours? I mean, how does it work in terms of, and is everything by memory? Because it seems to me that you're really about putting on an amazing show. You're not there with your yeah. you know, head, head in a real book kind of thing. But I mean, in terms of the PMJ stuff, are you, uh, how, how are you putting all of that together? Are you having to learn an entire set beforehand? Or you kind of just, does it change on the road? Does it evolve? And, or are you playing yeah. something very, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of levels to it, but I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I've been doing this for, for so long that generally, like any given postmodern jukebox set, I'm going to have at least half the material just memorized already from, you know, um, and, uh, but that said, we're just working with so many different singers now and, and, um, and the, the arrangements, new, great new arrangements are coming out all the time. So, so I do have to kind of like, you know, learn some of those ones, um, that, that some of them can be, you know, real, real tricky. Um, so, and, uh, I, you know, I like to have things memorized on stage. That's something I'm, I'm, I, I like to keep that as my ideal. But that said, like I have a process and I just don't, I won't go on stage unless I have had the time to like go through my process with like learning a song. Um, and that's just like, it's just a lot of time at home, just, you know, just getting off the book and just, and just repeating it. Cause some of the arrangements are really, they're pretty sophisticated. You know, it's not just like learning like a, you know, like a, like, you know, it's not just learning like a great American songbook form, no. you know? So, um, so yeah, that, that's sort of like, and also, I'm the band leader. Uh, I'm the the music director of the of the of the tours. Um, so it's it's also about like getting other people and how can we practice for everybody and not just me and my part. Um, and it's and everyone's at varying degrees of being able to you know being able to sight read and and just there's so, it's such a big tent of performers that you know you have to sort of like think of it in those terms as well. So I, it's a lot of responsibilities. Uh, most of the arrangements, when they come to you, uh, are whether are they all from Scott Bradley, or do they come from singers as well? And are they all they all written out, or is it just everything? And you kind of put it, bring it all together. I'm just wondering whether you're given a lot of, you know, notated parts, or, you know, uh, what does it look like when someone brings this new arrangement? Yeah. To you? Uh, no. So so. Uh, Virtually all the arrangements are, are done by Scott. Uh, there's okay. probably a few exceptions out there in the book now that I now that I think about it. But you know, it's sort of also like the question of like, what is it? Where does an arrangement come from? Like you know, it, it's he's it's always a kind of a give and take you know with with the with the singer. So I think that the you know the way that they they make the new arrangements is 
you know, Scott and a singer will, you know, meet up or they'll exchange voice memos or something like that and try to figure out like a, like a treatment for the song. And then, um, and then Scott, you know, sort of fleshes out the arrangement and, you know, just, just does all the, you know, whether it's horn parts or string parts or, or, you know, whatever craziness that we happen to be doing that day, uh, background vocals, choreography or so, well, his, 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 uh, his, his, the team helps with that, his partner helps with that as well. But then, but then eventually when it comes down to, to touring, you know, this, they're, they're, everything is notated in a, in a fairly, um, you know, precise manner, okay. um, just with lead sheets and horn parts. Um, but then there's more to it because you need to like sort of make it together like a, like a show. Like there needs to be sort of like connective tissues between the, the, the numbers. Um, it can't just be, you have to be thinking like, okay, once, you know, okay, I start reading the, you know, the page here and then there's that last, you know, that last bar and then boom, like we need to, you know, next one. No, like it's a show. So you, you can't just be sitting there with like dead air and just, you know, you hear, you know, you hear someone, <laughs> hear some coughing in the background. No, you know, we, 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 it's kind of cool with the, with the band because we kind of come up with like different ideas of like how can we transition from one song to the next, you know, in a way that's, that's sort of clever. And I think that's actually why people, a lot of people like working with PMJ is because like, you know, you, you can come up with some ideas, the whole band, whoever has a good idea. I mean, I'm like, okay, yeah, that's going to work for me. You know, sometimes it's just point at the piano player and, you know, hey, play something to cover this transition. Or sometimes it's like, like more, more elaborate and, and interesting. So it's, it's a, it's a, it's a funny, funny thing. Because your, your tours have really become a huge thing where people are dressing up there. You know, it's this vintage show, you know, it's much more than just, yeah. you know, <laughs> and uh, has it been fun seeing that evolve and, and creating this family that's around you when you're touring and whether it's the audience coming to different shows or, you know, the musicians and the crew that you're playing with, it, it's really gone beyond just a few people in a room. And this is huge, in, like, family now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You bring up a really good point um, is that, yeah, I mean, in addition to, to Postmodern Jukebox, like being being a concert, it's like it's so much more than that. Um, you know, they the whole vintage fashion movement is such a strong thing. Like people are out there all over the world, you know, going into these vintage shops and thrift shops and trying to put together like, you know, their, their best outfits and, and then wear them to the show. And the and so part of the thing is, you know, the especially the singers and the, you know, the, the, the ladies of, of, the, of the show, I mean, they are really, they're just decked out in this, these fantastic vintage outfits. And, and I think it gives a lot of people uh, inspiration, you know, just from, from the look. You know, it's, it's about bringing the vibe, but also like making sure that the, like the level of musicianship is high. But also to answer your question too, just the fact that it's been a, like a global movement too. It's like, I can pop into just about any city like in the world, you know, in, you know, North America, Europe, you know, Australia, New Zealand, a lot of places. And there will be people there that, that I know, you know, because then maybe they're like a great, you know, great musician or if they work with us or they've been a tap dancer with us or something like that. And it's just, it's just a nice feeling to know that, you know, you could just be, you could just, you know, you could just parachute into, I don't know, like Luxembourg and you'd you know, you'd probably be able to find somebody that like that you know and that you're cool with. You know. Are there any real standout gigs that you that comes? From? I mean, there must be so many. You've played so many, so yeah, many, so many shows. But is there any anything kind of that comes to mind? I, I think you know, we so we played a lot of big, amazing places. Um, we've played at uh, we played the Sydney Opera House two times. Yeah, um, we played at Red Rocks in Colorado. Oh, you, wow. We, yeah, they played at Olympia in, oh. in Paris. Um, you know, the, uh, the Roundhouse, the Palladium, all these places in London. Um, I, you know, I think for me, a standout gig always is, is when we played at Radio City Music Hall. Um, and it, that to me was when I was like, you know, I think there's always a part of me, you know, because I'm I'm a, I'm a lawyer as well, but that I'm 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 you know, always skeptical. Like nothing's real until it's real. You know what I mean? Yeah. But when we played at, at Radio City Music Hall, and it was like, it was to play for like thousands of people. You know, in in one of the most iconic venues in New York in the in the world. And just I'm trying to like remember who was you know Puddles the Clown was there and you know, Haley Reinhardt and Casey Abrams and all these like these just these fantastic performers and I was like okay I think I think I have a career in this now 
uh, I think <laughs> that's that's when it kind of like struck me that this was like a real, you know, like a this is this is my trajectory now. It's a wild ride, isn't it? To you know, to to join this thing, and I, what I love it, uh, about postmodern jukebox is that you've got this this setup which is like one camera one camera angle one frame and you are present to everybody it's the energy is so personal yeah. going into that camera and you you shape with your music and with the uh, you know with the dancing with the with the outfits with the storytelling yeah. and it's all so musical it's so so good yeah you know yeah yeah I mean I, I guess that's the thing that I like I really want to stress on this this thing um, yeah is that is just like the level of musicianship, um, even our recording process is like everything you see on the screen, you know, we are actually playing that. It's this, the track, yeah. you know what I mean? Like we are not, it's very rare that, that someone will comp anything. Like I could probably count on one hand, like, you know, and, um, and, it's just hard to, it's really, really, it makes it much more difficult when you need to make sure that the visual component of the thing uh, and the audio component like line up and there's no technical glitches. Like you just, you have to like, just make sure that, that those things line up at least like a couple of times and that the performing level is high at the same time. Like, so we're doing it for real. These are all real musicians. And I know there's so much like visual component to it, but it's like you, you have to start with great musicianship. And if you don't have that, all the, all the charming, you know, the funny stuff, you know, the, the choreography, the, you know, the banter, it doesn't, it's just pretty, it's pretty, you know, it's, it's, it's dressing. It's important dressing for sure. But, the, but the, it starts with the musicianship. And I think that's what, what I'm, you know, really proud of, especially the, some of the people that I've shared the stage with that are like, just mind-blowingly talented folks. Something like, uh, I was watching uh, your, the version uh, of o o All About the Bass, and the way it's, with the singers, it is so intimate. And yeah. it's so, you know, you must feel that energy, but also feel excited to be part of that and buoyed to do it. But you've really got to bring your A game because you don't want to be the person at the end who goes, sorry. <laughs> you know? Like those performances are just. Yeah, you've, so you've, you've just presented, pre presented like a, a peek into my mind when I'm doing the recordings is that like, is, you know, all these singers or all these dancers and they're just, they're just crushing it, you know? And then, and, and then, and then, all, yeah. And then all of a sudden you're just, you just, you play, you just play that one note and you're like, oh man, that note, you know? And then, and then hopefully it's, you then, oh, you're like, well, hopefully this, they won't keep this one, you know? So maybe something else will happen and then I'll get another chance at it or something like that. So it's a, it is definitely stressful and, and, you know, and just complete uh, transparency of like my own like vulnerability as a as a person. Like when I when I f was first doing this, like I, I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I had barely recorded. Like I was in law school. You know, like and then once the thing started getting bigger, and these people are coming in from like you know Juilliard, like New School. You know, some famous some famous people. You know, like Dave Cause. You know, came in and and man that's when you start getting in your in your head about like oh my god i'm not, you know you get that that that's terrible imposter syndrome thing have you got any advice about how to get out of that if you're you know we, we, those opportunities come up for us in life where we're getting to stand alongside people that we're perhaps our peers or we're looking up to or you know because yeah. uh, you've just worked with so many incredible people um and uh, and you seem so confident and at, at, at peace there but I, was it a struggle do you have any Man, it was a it was a total struggle, you know, at the beginning, especially with some of the people that we were that we were bringing in. Um, I think it's just knowing, you know, being confident in like what you bring to the to the process um, as a as a as a performer, you know, as a person, you know, as well. But also, you know, I've just been really fortunate to get to sort of repeat the the process of of like first you you kind of go through that. Uh, oh man, like, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't know, I'm not supposed to be here. Um, and then eventually you're like, no, like I, I am supposed to be here. And you kind of like take on that sort of growth mindset, um, sort of, sort of place. And you go, you know, I got to just try for what I want to do, try for my ideal. And if I mess up or, you know, I fall short of where I want to be, then that's an opportunity to, to improve. And just, I try to be mindful of like, when I go on stage um, or I perform 
or practice or go to jam session where how many if i mess something up okay you know in my mind like okay cool so that's something i need to address you know what i mean so what about that do i need to address okay uh and then or even if i'm just checking in with my 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 mind and my body my emotions and i'm like and i'm thinking like in my head i'm thinking okay you know really focusing super hard on this one part like that's also an opportunity to go why do i need to like feel like i need to dedicate like 80% of my attention to this this thing and not just be like like oh man like i'm having a conversation with you and it's just mm. fun because it's easy because we both know how to speak this language you know so it's just being paying attention to like your your feelings and try to try to you know, address them in a way that's compassionate to yourself I think with your playing, I see somebody who's really like playing out into the world, you know? I like, you see that through the camera, the connection is so strong. And yeah. the artists that you have with you and the family of people that are getting together to make this music, it just feels so positive and everybody is kind of yeah. bringing each other up and moving forward and, and not sat there thinking, what's next? You know, it's all about, you know, love yeah. and pushing the music out there and, and entertain and joy, you know? Yeah, well, thank you for bringing that up. I mean, I, I think that's maybe, you know, I don't have to get into too deeply into, into self psychology, but I think that, you know, f for me, trying to make people feel like everyone feel welcome, you know, and like we're, we're all in this together to have fun. You know, we're not in this to make anybody feel bad. You know, someone is like maybe not as good of a reader, you know, as somebody else. Like, you're like, you know, it's cool. We we'll just, you just, you know, we'll work with you. You need more reps on this we're good you know i just want to get people to that comfortable place and i think for me especially at the beginning of postmodern jukebox like when i was unsure of myself but it was like it worked for me because i was playing music with my friends and they made me feel comfortable um and and i realized that by focusing on the fun part of it you know you can really a lot of that nervous energy that you have inside of you can kind of come out you know in that in that fun way and make it better a better environment for for yourself for making the people around you feel comfortable and when you go and you and you play on a for a video like that you know just like they can see that you are having fun you're not taking yourself too seriously you know about it and and i think that there's a, people identify with that you know, they identify with that, like, like you're doing this because you're doing something that's fun for you. And uh, for me, I like, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, uh, that's where I'm going to start from as a, as a musician, you know, I, yeah. you know, I like really serious music as well, but it's for me, it's just like, you know, you go out and you, and you have fun and, and you, and you bring, you draw people to what you're doing. I love uh, following your Instagram stuff with uh, Casey Abrams, and it's so much fun for me to see two of my base heroes together, just doing, just having so much fun. And I just wonder if you could speak about that relationship, and maybe the bass players of PMJ, some of the, you know, Kate Davis. You know, there's there's been oh, yeah. so many, there's so much cool stuff going on. How's your experience been with those other bass players, and perhaps hitting on how, your relationship with Casey? Because that seems like you you guys have a yeah, you have a good time when you're out on the road. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, for the Discover Double Bass people, it's not, it's not like a secret knowledge that like bass players like to bro out for the most part. We're <laughs> like, we're always cool with each other. It's not, you know, it's not, not competitive, you yeah. know. I mean, it is competitive. It's always a little competitive, right? We always want get, get to those, get those gigs or whatever like that. But... I don't think no one really does it like in an underhanded, you know, way, at least yeah. people that I don't know. Uh, anyways, yeah, I mean, Casey and I, we just do so such different things, you know, and he's such, he's like such a sweet, like genuine guy, yeah. you know, that, and we both have like a really stupid sense of humor that we just like are always joking and just, and he's like directing like dumb, like skits, like, uh, he used to have this like this like this skit he used to do called Hippie Swat Man. I, it, I remember that and the dude with the glasses. And it, the it makes thing. no <laughs> sense. Like it really it makes it like it makes no sense. And I played a I played a villain yeah, on it yeah. called called Snark NATO, not not Shark NATO, <laughs> Snark NATO, because I'm because I can be kind of snarky. Uh, and it was just you know we just do stuff like that. He's just on another. I mean, and musically he's just on another planet. I mean, he's just like he that stuff just music just flies out of him yeah in a way that's just it's just it's such an inspiration uh and it's he's just 
come to playing the bass in a really different way than a way different approach, you know, than I have. And for me, it's, it's, it's like really refreshing, but like, again, he's like a really inclusive guy. Like he's, you know, he's never, she's never trying to say like, no, you can't do this. Like yeah. he's always trying to be like, oh, how can we get, you know, so-and-so that person, that person all together and, and just for the, you know, the, what is it? The, the whole is better than the sum of its parts. Um, so, I, you know, I, I, I absolutely love Casey and, and yeah, we just, we just, we just always sending each other like really, really dumb messages and stuff <laughs> like that. So he's, he's my bass brother for sure. And other great bass players, you know, there's like, uh, Steve Whipple. He's a, he's a guy that, that he's, uh, um, he's played with so many great, you know, players over the years. He plays with, uh, Lady Gaga's music director, uh, Brian, Brian, uh, Newman and, um, he's played with uh, Toshiko Akiyoshi. He's played with like a tons of great people, and he's just he's just like a really nice, you know, just always sharing, you know, just tips about how to how to do this thing better, and 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 I think that's the that's the spirit, you know, that's the that's the base spirit. That's the that's the you know the, the that's we're all in base camp together. We're all you know what I mean. That's the Barry Green the Barry Green ethos. So. Oh, man. Well, before we wrap things up, maybe we could talk as all bass players do about gear because oh, you, can't, you can't go anywhere without. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. Like, let's just take a look. You obviously have been, well, not obviously, but you have been traveling with this bass. Is this your main axe? Is this what you spend all your time with in terms of the upright world? Yeah, I think, yeah, because, I, because I'm on tour so much, I'm always playing this, uh, this, this uh, David Gage designed check ease uh flyaway bass i believe that's the, that's the, the full name that, that's, I, I think that's the full name um so i'm on this instrument a lot it's this thing has been through 10 years of touring with postmodern jukebox wow. i never had to have a real repair done to it uh that casey actually knocked that off that's <laughs> he did that oh. and anyway i know yeah I'll, I'll take out the nice stuff you said about him <laughs> exactly <laughs> Yeah, he, did, he didn't cop up to it, but uh, I know he did it. Uh, Anyways, um, and uh, yeah, so this thing has been great, great for me. When I'm home, I have a, I have a different bass, uh, one that actually Barry picked out for me. I guess the company's name is Dual Joy. It's a Chinese company and they're making really nice carved bases. Yeah. One piece back. I got the Francois Raboth Labrie Labrie N pin on there because yeah, because yeah, that's that's the way I learned how to play. Um, and. Uh, yeah, you know, it takes a while to kind of switch back, you know, when I have to transition back to the other bass, it takes a little while to get all everything, you know, intonation and things dialed in. But um, I got I got the, the Diodario uh, Zyx, Zyx strings on there. I have a I have a, you know, a deal with them. And so that's been really helpful to me over the years is getting getting strings, you know, just free free strings all the time. But they, they have some wow. good thump. I think they need to be replaced. Um, but um, and then, yeah, just, you know, touring, I guess touring is like, with the, the upright bass as a whole, it's a different, different beast. Yeah, you know, we just got all the, you know, all the, all the gear that you. I don't endorse them, but we, you know, they're just good gear. You know, really nice stuff. I actually do. I have a. Um, I started playing through, and I'm still working out the, the uh, Neural DSP Quad Cortex pedal. Wow, this is not something I'm aware of, but it sounds, I know, it sounds I, fancy. I know. It sounds like I just said something like really crazy, like yeah, I just yeah, made up something. Of. No, it's a it's a Finnish based company, um, and they just make this this uh, th this pedal. It's just, you know, it's just digital signal processing, and and it's man, it is a super, it's a very robust pedal. Like you could spend as much time learning that thing as you would learn like how to you know use like you know like a new laptop with you know like whatever you know like the 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 highest level of you know pro tools like you'd spend so much time like learning all that stuff uh and it's just it's really it's got a lot to it you know i'm still trying to like it's got like amp modeling uh you know it's got all basically anything like a pedal could do um so and i'm still it's it's just really nice because other, if you have to switch between bases and i play electric bass it the amount of things that need to be chained together including tuners and uh and di's and everything it's it's like it's just crazy and if something goes wrong on stage like it's you know the stakes are high so you can't be there trying to repatch every single thing that's on the pedal so it's nice just to have one unit that's about that big everything is sort of like you know digital uh, you have to kind of like there's a learning curve to make sure you don't you know you know step on the wrong pedal and some crazy sound comes out um, but that's but that's on me because I still need to learn how to use it so what about amplifiers do you just do you what do you ask for because I take it you don't carry anything yourself you know you're gonna just 
No, you, we have our we have our gear. Do you buy? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what we're, we're right now the the PMJ stuff that I have. Uh, it's a uh, it's a it's an Aguilar tone hammer cabinet or excuse me uh, a head and uh, and it's a Mark base cabinet um, and and yeah that's that's just what I use and, and but we you know I the more and more like I do this um, when you play in a in like a big big band big group it's not a big band but it's a yeah. large group you know the drummer is is often very loud uh, two horn players tap dancer you know singers belting you know, guitar, loud guitar, piano, and then you're playing in a, you know, we just played in a really, really sonically crazy room um, in, in Belfast a few nights ago. And, and the in-ears, the in-ear thing is, is so great. And I know some people are resistant to it, um, but for, for me in this, in this context, it's, they're like, it, it's changed everything for me because I used to wake up and my ears would be ringing, you know, in the morning and I'm just like, oh my God, like that's, I mean that's damage. Yeah. Um, so I, I started to get uh, I started using in ears and it just the the amount the where you can place the beat um, you know in in regards to like you know your relationship to the drummer and the other rhythm section players it, it's just it's just made everything so much cleaner uh, to just to be able to hear what people are doing. There's so much just that that interplay on a big stage it's one thing if you're in a small jazz club and you and you're you know it's so easy to hear everything and th this is not that environment there's loud things going on everything needs to be cute horn players across the stage need to be cute tap dancer across the stage need to be cute singers you know need to like we need to catch like the, they're they're doing something different every single night with their voice so the the communication that you need and if you're lagging behind because you're using a floor monitor or you're just listening to your amp you're you know it's so everything about in ears is is to me on this type of gig is very very valuable i think everyone should learn to use in ears, you'll save your ears. You'll have a better show. And I just got hooked up with the artist deal with this this company called West Tone, and I'm looking forward to get, getting those delivered to me um, really soon. Oh, well, I think that's absolutely great advice. And uh, it's just thank you so much for for joining us today. And like as a last kind of final question for you, you know, we we started off talking about Barry, who was this big influence on you, and then I mentioned that you guys had reconnected. What about when you're at this place now in your career where you've played, you know, you've been touring for the last decade, and the students or the young people, the less experienced bass players who are coming to see you, do you have any kind of words of advice for those players that are in the audience at the postmodern jukebox gig thinking, I want to do that, or I want to, you know, in the way that you wanted to sound like your heroes when you were younger, what advice do you have for them? Your parting words, maybe. Like, oh, okay, well, I mean, I think it's just to kind of go where, go where your, your joy is, um, um, do, do what excites you, where you can bring the most, you know, enthusiasm, the most spark to things. And, um, you know, I mean, listen to your teachers, but also like, um, keep your own, your own, you know, mind about things. I think, you know, sometimes teachers have, have an, an agenda with when they, when they go and they, they take on students that, and I think you know you need to be real about what you can get you know from a teacher and and what and what they're you know they're human beings too they have they have their hangups so you know I don't ever try to and I'm like the one of the most unorthodox players you know I think you'll meet like I you know it's like I don't have I don't stay in my lane because I don't I never <laughs> had a I don't think I had a lane um, so it's just to it's just to like be okay with like making your own version of things I mean you know for me like. But it also like, you know, learning so much jazz has been great because it's just really teaches you like, it just teaches you about everything and, and, and just harmony and, and, you know, soloing and interaction. And so that was such a valuable thing, but, but don't, the orthodoxies, I think they're made to be, made to be broken. Yeah. You know? Follow the joy. Follow the joy. That's, that's all it is. Yeah. Adam, I love that. Listen, I was going to say, where can people find you online? Actually, all you need to do is turn on YouTube and about every third video is <laughs> on my channel. It's both Modern Jukebox because uh, you guys are getting out there and they're so popular. But what, what, what else? Do you have any other projects you want to share or a website or any social media or anything that you want to just, you know, for people at home who want sure. to find out more about you? Sure. I mean, um, I mean, I, you know, I think the best way you can reach me is just through the normal social media. Yeah. I think it just uh, what's my Instagram is uh, uh, Adam Kubota underscore bass. 
Good. good. I mean, yeah, that's yeah, pretty nerdy, <laughs> but that's all right. You know, I'm on Facebook. I'm on, I have a I have a website, cool. and you can obviously you know see me on the PMJ videos. Um, but I think this is a good opportunity for me to sort of like speak it into the world that you know it's like. I, you know, I've been doing, I've been working so much as a sideman. I play with other groups. I work a lot. I do in you know, a lot of sideman work with uh, with Gunhild Carling. Oh, and she's and amazing. She's amazing. <laughs> yeah, uh, check her out. And, and another band in the U.S. called the Hot Sardines. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, another. You know, fortunate to work with them. So, you know, I'm full time sideman. Um, but for me, I think I need to to put my own feet to the fire to like you know just start doing my own you know my own work my own projects and you know because there's a lot of gratification in in pursuing your own ideal um as a musician and and it's i i i really enjoy the work i appreciate the work i love being a side man but also you know there's more to 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 being a musician yeah i think that's a wonderful place to finish adam thank you so much for joining me yeah. sir yeah sure. absolute pleasure to meet you thanks for having me